This is uh, Baba and the Future, part seven. The subject is causation, causes of things. How things are caused. And um, our, um, I'm not gonna give any preamble to this. We're just gonna go right in. Our current thinking can't solve problems of cause, which you'll, you'll see, okay? Like the perceptual problem, which you'll see better when we get to there. Remember, the causal problem is the big problem of the mind-body problem. How do we perceive the world? Um, or life, how, how, okay, so, now, this is something. I'm gonna read it. We see correlations with our eyes. Correlations means this happens and then this. If I had a, a slide that put a little uh, rock on this side of the slide, or a baby, and I push down, I see a correlation. When this goes down, the baby goes up. But I don't see the cause. I just see the effect. Okay, I, okay? that's a correlation. And this, when I drop this rock, it'll fall. That's what I actually perceive. I, I perceive that when I drop the rock, I perceive that it falls. But I don't, now, but we cannot see, perceive so-called causal links. Even that, the, like the link between my dropping it and its falling. Even that there are causal links is a theory. Even what we mean by the word cause is not entirely clear. As odd as that may sound, it is an accepted fact since the 18th century, since David Hume pointed it out. It is an un, un, undisputed fact. This will, it will begin more clear. Now, all the questions that we've covered so far have actually been causal questions. What was fundamental to what scientists today can't figure out, they all come down to um, the cause. And remember that last, uh, long ago, I, I gave this, um, this example of um, uh, the Big Bang, and, and the Big Bangs um, happened long ago, but the, the, but there was no uh, s like space before the Big Bang. So the Big Bang, the space was supposed to be in the Big Bang. Well, then where was the Big Bang? Or it couldn't be somewhere because if you remove space, would, then you're just talking gibberish. You're talking about okay, if you're talking about something physical, a physical event, and it's not located, it, you're talking gibberish. That's a property of physical things. Same with time. They say time was in it, and then therefore it wasn't in time. Well, therefore it couldn't have happened. Okay. So that, that's a bugaboo. And the point of this is that this is an attempt to explain the physical world of rocks and, and stuff like that and matter. So it doesn't work. So it's a causal problem. And another one is uh, how do you get the first life form? They, they don't know, Darwin never admitted he didn't know. And uh, to this day, you can look it up, and there, there's no current theory for how life begins. It's pretty popularly know, understood. Okay. Now, of course, the, the mind-body problem we've been talking about is also um, a question of cause. What causes us to see the world around us? Scientists still don't know, which is what we've spent so much time on. For instance, in this uh, picture here, we have these, um, this electrical firing. Uh, it's, a, as I said, a kind of an idealized picture of firing. The brain it doesn't really have lights, uh, of Christmas lights in it, but it, it, it conveys that. But how do those electric firings turn into experience of the world? Okay. Nobody has any, uh, we said that last week. There's not even a theory for it. Uh, that's the miracle. I think we should be more explicit here in step two, where the miracle happens. We don't know. And that's uh, absolutely uncontroversial. And there's been a TED Talks about that. Okay, so that, that's where we're at. We don't know. Um, so, while it's not always fully recognized by other philosophers, it is a causal problem. They, they, they're not as clear as I've gotten on it. Okay. So far from giving us answers, each such failed, oh, did I say something? I think I missed. 
The history of the mind-body problem, which we've been going over for six weeks, has been a history of a series of failed attempts to answer that question. How do we experience the world? This is the underlying, though rarely recognized question underlying the mind-body problem. Far from giving us answers, each such failed attempt that we've been going over uh, to answer the question of what causes our experience in us has only created more problems. For instance, the external world. That's how we got the external world. Now we got reality is cannot be perceived, so we, it's very hard to explain how something that you can't see perceives what you see, since you can't see it to check. So you, you can't compare it uh, in any way. How are you going to for no sooner do philosophers or scientists invent an answer, lo and behold, they have a new worse problem, which I just explained. Something's wrong in our thinking, and it centers on our thinking about causation. And these are examples that we've gone over. Okay, so Plato came up with his forms. These are all attempts to explain our experience of the world. Aristotle had a wax and stamp analogy. Press of whack, but this is the metaphor. The Stoics, I, I hope you remember, they had the idea that um, a person is looking up here at the world and out of his eyes and everything is, comes the octopus. And the octopus is made of, um, of a psych, which is a theoretical stuff. Okay, psych stuff. And uh, the, this was called the, the common sense, not in the modern term. To a sense, but a sense that brings, can integrate them. And uh, that's what, that was one of the weirder theories, but it gets a good example. And then Barclay's God Mind. Barclay's God Mind was just as strange. You have God's mind over here, and you have your mind, and then God implants those in there. But we got a problem because uh, we, how does he implant them? I guess we have to just rely on his magical power to do that because Barclay didn't say. He just said, used the word, he implants copies of the ideas in his mind. So it's very mysterious. So Now Locke, if you remember, he had the idea that you've got numbers and like equations and, you know, plus, okay. And they rest in well, a supposed substratum of some sort, which was very mysterious. We'll discuss that. And Kant had the noumenon, the, the world that you can't see, the thing in itself, but uh, never explained how the thing in itself is uh, feeding you uh, information. He had the lenses, but he, he, he didn't really work it out. The thing in itself became the bugaboo. And then uh, contemporary philosophers have the electric thing, which I showed you just now. And then even in Hinduism, if you look up Hindu, uh, Maya, uh, there are different means. One is that the, the word means uh, illusion, but the more the one that Baba ascribed to, it just it means the force that causes you to see things um, illusorily, okay? See the false and see it as real. However, there is nothing in Hinduism that explains how it does so. As a matter of fact, all, all references to, to how it does so refer to magic. As a matter of fact, the word mad, uh, maya, etymologically, it comes from uh, a word from just magic. Okay, so like a magician can make you see stuff, okay? So it's like, a, it's a magic show, an illusion show. So um, you can look that up. Uh, it mentions magic in the article uh, 46 times in the article on, on uh, maya. And, and it's a good article, it is. It covers all the Buddhist and the Hindu use of the word. There are even more such questions. Um, we've already gone over the first three, but we have intuitions. We have intuitions like we know that one plus one is going to be two tomorrow and the day after, but we can't see tomorrow. How do we know? Just because um, two popsicles sticks added up to, th to uh, two today, how do we know it's going to be tomorrow? That sounds silly, but that's called an intuition. We don't know how we know, but we do know that. And so, how did, what causes that? What causes those intuitions? And there are laws of nature. Gravity, 
Boyle's Law, you have laws of nature. Okay, how do these things get there? What caused them to come into being? So there are all kinds of problems. Magic is not good enough for us today. It was good enough for us very recently. And for some people, it continues to be. Um, and if it satisfies you and you have love for God, great. But there's a lot of people that are losing their faith in God. So we need to talk to them. And that's, that's partly who we're talking to in the future. Remember the simplistic explanation I gave of an invisible magical turtle. Okay, so we could, if we, a guy named Oakham, who was a Franciscan friar, he, he, he developed uh, the ideas of science, uh, scientific method. He came up with the idea that the simplest solution is the best. Okay, and that's been proved uh, probabilistically in the 20th century. But, however, the simplest possible explanation for the world is just magic. Okay, so I have a magical turtle, and it creates, created the world, and it's, just, and it's creating it all the time, and that's how. See, yeah, I explained it. And then you go, well, I can't see it. How come I can't see it? And I go, well, it's invisible. That's part of its magic. So as simple as that, I just explained the entire universe, but that's not good enough. Okay, nobody, because um, you, could, you could come up with a magical something else, or a magical this, or I'm really doing it, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> That a theory can't be disproven, such as the magical turtle. We can't disprove that there's a magical turtle creating the world. That's not sufficient as evidence that there is. A lot of things can't be disproven. I could make up millions of things that you can't disprove. So don't think that, oh, you can't disprove it as if you've got something in your pocket. Don't have anything. If magic were sufficient, sufficient my theory of an invisible magical turtle would suffice. And we could all go home. That is what science has relied on, we're going to see, so far. Magic. Now, I got to talk about, a, 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 introduce a new term, a couple new terms today, but they're not difficult. The difference between a nominal cause, a, a nominal means something that exists in name only, so, and an actual explanation. So a nominal cause would be like my magical term. I, he's called my magical turtle. I could call him Fred, but he's the and he and I could say, well, he causes everything, and so that's in name only a cause. Okay. Um, now nominal causes are always based on images I've seen. For instance, I've seen turtles. Okay, um, they're always like a picture in your head. Okay, and these um, we've seen the world around us, and um, we hypostatize them. Okay, which I've explained in the past that I won't repeat. We look around us and based on something we see around us, we imagine something like it, like the turtle. We give it a name and declare it the cause. It's a name for a know-not-what. So remember Kant's thing in itself and um, uh, the substratum over there, okay, or the... Um, he, he, John Locke who invented that substratum for, for um, mathematical qualities that holds up the matter. It, it's a no, he even admitted it, it's a no, not why. And Barclay saw that too. But the question remains, how does the invented causal thing bring about what it is said to cause? That's a much more important question about cause. Not what is causing it, that's just a nominal cause. We want to know, well, how does it do it? And that's what we mean by an explanation. So the difference between cause and explanation. This requires a process. A process is how a cause causes what it is said to cause. Um, that's what we mean by a real explanation. Okay? By the way, we do have some processes in science in recent years, like in the uh, in the 20th century, in the 1970s, they used to be this idea of continental drift, like the, like continents floated around like floating islands. But then uh, they came up with, they realized this tectonics, and you have lava coming up, and it's pushing up, and in other places you have sub subluxation, and the, the, the plates are going down under each other on the other side of the earth. And that's how they moved. See, they saw a process. And so the world used to be one big continent called Pangaea. And then through plate tectonics, 
and, and lava coming up and subducting on the other side of somewhere else, the plates are moving all the time. Kind of like bubbles in the toilet with you. <laughs> Well, you're you're not you're not men, but Jeff will understand. <laughs> That's like so. Okay, but the question remains: How? Okay, so that requires a process. Uh, that's what we mean by that. So we want to cause, but also what it, um, also how it causes. And I give examples of things I'm referring to: Plato's forms, which is those things. Gordy gone over that. Now I want to introduce the idea of a mythene. It's the same thing as a. Um, Nominal cause. A mytheme is a, a unit of mythical imagery passed down in cultures. Um, the external world is a mytheme. Okay? It's, um, but we'll get to see that more why. why. Mythemes convey the concept of a hypostasis. I uh, won't repeat that. That's several talks ago. What a hypostasis is, you can look back. They are visually grounded, perhaps. And that's perhaps why they appeal to us, because we, we like pictures in our head. We like to think in pictures. And we project them from our memories of pictures we perceive in daily life. This appears to be a remnant of the period that Baba talked about before reason, which he called sensation. By the way, Baba never called it an age of sensation or an age of intuition or an age of reason. He just said there's a transition going to be a transition from reason to intuition, like the transition from sensation to reason. I believe that the reason we think this way is because we're still thinking like we did. We have a remnant, it's a vestigial of how we used to think. When we just came up with the fairies and gods and sprites and things. From this archaic method, a sensation stand as analogs for causes and the images we imagine and the likes of them function as causes. We literally picture them. From the archaic method, we get the occult powers, substances, and particles that form the foundation of our thinking about cause from ancient times right up to science today, right this moment. In essence, we never fully left the age of, like I said that, we simply apply reasoning to it and by reasoning, we can never discover that we are stupid. And I'll show you how. You have to understand something about logic. Uh, lo we all use the word logic all the time, and we don't really know what we mean. But logic is a, is a, is a part of, um, is, a, is an area of philosophy. So um, it has a real meaning. Uh, uh, logic is always based on if, then. All logic is reducible to if, then. Now you don't know whether the premise is true. It's just, it's, it's a valid argument if it seems intuitively to follow from if this was true, then that was true. So if the substratum is creating the world, um, uh, then um, this, um, this uh, object here is uh, being created by the substratum. Okay, that falls. We, so it's valid. We assume the premise that the sub, about the substratum that we just talked about. So we're never going to escape. It's circular. It's just feeding back to us what we already think. That's all logic can do. All you could possibly find is that you contradicted your premise. So if you go, well, if the substratum underlies all math and and then the number, th and the number, but the number three is not, then you have contradicted yourself. I hope. People thought watching this will be able to follow that. Okay, we'll get back into that in a minute about logic. Now, remember John Locke uh, a couple talks ago. I think it was two talks ago. Um, talk five, this is talk seven. He referred to his substratum, which I just drew. And I have a picture here of um, myself drawing his substratum from that top. And I'm talking about the qualities of the apple and uh, the, the quantifiable qualities, like it's three by five uh, centimeters or something. The, they um, rest on the substratum. Now, he said, he referred to his substratum as an unknown support of qualities to which we give the general name substance. 
being nothing but the supposed but unknown support of those qualities we find existing and which we imagine can't exist without some thing to support them. I'm quoting him there. And uh, this, uh, this quote is interesting by Locke. We have as poor a grasp of the idea of bodily substance as we have of spiritual substance or spirit. Okay. Like uh, a mind. So. We're going to come back to um, him in a second. The external world is simply a nominal cause, a name, a play, a matter uh, in philosophy. Okay, it, it's a it's a placeholder term for a no, not what. It is based on pictures, but no process. There's no process in how it does it. No more than magic. It is not an explanation, which requires a process, as I explained by which the cause does its causing. The external world is thus no more than a mythian. Um, now, note we see the same thing in all past forms of explanation that I've covered. We've covered 3,000 years of them, okay? Because we go back before the Greeks. We, we started with the Iliad. Thales, in 600 BC, said it was water. Plato, these forms, we have the same thing, they're nominal causes, they're mythians. And today, the external world, which you'll read in every contemporary book on philosophy of mind, or philosophy of perception, the external world, it's on every, external world, external world, external world. This is the invisible external world, not the world of experience. This sense of magic is captured in modern property dualists word, supervene supervenience, which simply means caused by. So mental states supervene upon physical states. Um, that mean, uh, another thing they like to say is that they give rise to uh, yeah, the, the, the mental states. But how? See, it's just, it's just saying, well, the cause, see, is the cause. That's all it is. It's a tautology. Okay. Now, there's an objection to all these mythemes, and this has been known since Plato. Plato was the one who discovered it. It's an objection to his own idea of forms, originally, and it was called the, the third man argument, and he didn't call it that. But remember that, that Plato had that for every man there has to be a form, and by his own, th and for every horse there has to be a horse form, okay? And for each, for anything that's a general, there has to be a, 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 a form in the world of forms. But the problem is that, well then, by the same reasoning, they need, they need to have a form. The forms need form. And, uh, and this goes on uh, infinitely. And um, so it doesn't work. Uh, and he began to think he had something wrong. He had tried other, if you go back, you'll see he had tried other ideas to explain how we um, have general ideas. Um, now this, uh, this, this, this third man, it applies to all these nominal causes. John went Luck, who we talked about, just um, went on to compare his own substratum to the mytheme of the world turtle, which is very similar to my joke. In comparing it to this mytheme, where it is said the world sits on an elephant which in turn sits on a tortoise, and he says, but being again pressed to know what gave support to the broad-backed tortoise, he knew not what. Speaking of a, 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 a Hindu version. Now, the, this, the, the world turtle is not just in, it's in Hinduism, it's in Chinese um, mythology, and it's even in American Indian mythology. John Locke, uh, okay, called the third man, it was first noticed by by Plato as a reasonable objection to his idea of form. So we can really see it with this fun picture here of the world turtle, the third main objection, because we see that um, we, have, um, we have the world on top of the, um, ele elephants and the elephants. Um, let's see these things, they die. And, uh, that, then that's on that. And, um, and then the turtle, and then, and then you keep going down, and then what do you got under the turtle? So in this picture there's water, but then, you know, what's under the water? And that's an old joke. 
Um, it's in a, a famous book by uh, Stephen Hawking uh, called um, A Brief History of Time. He talks about the turtle. Um, <clears throat> this is known to ancients, but seemingly lost to moderns. Well, let's see. Remember I said um, how the scientists, I, I have to kind of read this because it, it was supposed to be black, uh, white, and it's black. Um, there. It says, um, we can explain all without God. Okay? And this is supposed to be what? Aliens did it. Okay? And literally, there's a Many scientists believe that we were seeded by aliens because they can't find any explanation for life. So they resort to this. And what is this? It's a mythene. Um, the problem is and, is, and you can't read that, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, this, this, I won't go into technicals. But how did the aliens get there? Well, that's the question. That's the third man argument. If these people were more up on metaphysics, they would know that they're committing a, 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 a problem. This repeats with the holographic universe. The holographic universe theory goes like this. We're learning, uh, we now know how to make these virtual reality um, games that you play on the computer, and now they have headsets that you can put on, sort of, and uh, with, head, with stereo, and it's getting better and better and better, okay? So uh, just by extrapolation, uh, pure induction, we can see that in the, by, you know, in 100 years, we'll be able to perfect it, and a person will be able to literally believe that they're in a world, but it's really just being done by you know, a bunch of computer programmers that stuck these things on their head and left them there, okay? The problem with that is there's a third man argument. My daughter is very smart. I told her this thing, and she's the one who saw the third man problem immediately. She said, well, by, and the, the claim is that because we will one day be able to do that, the chances are billions to one that we're not in a hologram. Billions to one. That's the chances. But by the same exact logic, those aliens or whoever who are doing this, by the, it's billions to one that they're not also in somebody else's hologram. <laughs> by the, exactly the same logic. So it goes on. It's called an infinite regress doesn't work. What is it we really need to explain? It seems like we're explaining a lot of things. It seems like we're explaining um, how did life begin, how, how did the Big Bang happen, um, you know, we've got a lot, we, how does, uh, uh, how do we experience the world, what's causing that from the, but really it's just one thing we're trying to explain. And this is kind of a, an important segue in thinking. We've established that experience must have a cause. We already established that. That's what the whole history of the mind-body problem was about, a search for how to explain how we experience the world. That's a mind-body problem, okay? It follows then that experience, um, I kind of jumped the gun when I started, but we'll get to it. Um, I see how I did this. It follows that experience is an effect, okay? It's an effect of something. If we're looking for the cause, it's an effect of something. Everybody seems to know what it's the effect of. It's the electricity, or it's, you know, or it's the, it's the, or it's God's mind in planting, or it's something, or it's forms, it's the effect of something. But when you have something and it's the cause and it's the effect, let's put a little arrow there. Okay. So our experience is an effect of what we don't yet know. And we're, and we're not going to get, if you, we're not going to, we're not going to jump ahead and guess. But I showed that. What is what it is an effect of its cause is thus what we are looking for. Okay? Obviously, whatever it is that's causing our experience cannot be 
in our experience, for we would not expect to find a cause in what it is causing. Let, let me demonstrate that uh, this way. Oh, here's the world. Okay. Let's pretend that that's all we know. We're, we're living in the, mid, the Middle Ages or something. We don't think about other planets and stuff. The stars are going around the Earth. Okay. So we want to find the cause of this. Okay. This is, which means this is an effect. Well, wouldn't it be strange to start looking for the cause in it? Did you hear what I'm saying? This is new. Okay. It wouldn't make sense because looking in it, you're looking in what it is we're trying to explain with our cause. We're looking in the effect for the cause. So I want to explain all this stuff, how this stuff got here on this table. It would seem very strange to start looking around on the table. If the person listening, which is you, if you are right now in trying to conceive the cause of things, which I don't think you are because you're too smart for this, but if a person watching the video and in the, you know, if they're trying to imagine it, that too is looking for the cause of experience in the effect because your imagination is part of your experience. You will experience your, your memories, your imagination, your thoughts. So to go looking into your imagination for it, which is what we've always done, that's what I think is a vestigial of the time of sensation that Baba talked about. Then we're committing this fallacy. For his imagination belongs to experience also. So we've been searching for causes in all the wrong places. There's a song, it's looking for love and love. If this series has shown us anything, it is that the search for cause began with the ancient Miletians 2,600 years ago at the start of reason, looking for something around them to be a cause, or an analogy for it. For Thales, the first person we studied, okay, it was water. Or another interpretation of Thales is that it was a magnetism which he found in certain rocks called magnetite or lodestones. The rest of the philosophers we've covered likewise use such images in their mind of things they'd seen and they used them as, to use as analogies and then posited, like those statized, projected, some occult, occult means hidden. It doesn't mean supernatural here. This is, a, I'm using the archaic use of the word. Some occult similar thing as an underlying cause, some unseen thing. So for instance, the external world explains our, our experiential world. It's just like our experiential world, um, but it's a mythium, it's a hypostasis of that. But these were only nominal causes, mythiums. None had any real explanatory power. The external world doesn't explain anything. We're stuck trying to explain the external world. Um, because of the third man argument. Okay, this is some of my world of my experience is caused by another one I can't see. That's sort of like it. Well, now I gotta have a world to explain it. If that's gonna be the way, the way we do it. Now I'm gonna imagine another one. And ah, da, da, da. So that's, that's a failure of reasoning. This is, this is what's wrong, see. None of these philosophers ever considered how the thing they invented caused what it was intended to cause. They never did. We've effectively been mining the effects of the cause for the effect of, of mining the effects for the cause of the effects. This is the error in human reasoning since reason began. And I told you last two talks, I said, I'm going to tell you what's wrong. That is what is wrong. That's not the only thing that's wrong. But it's the underlying of, of what we're, uh, the narrative we're telling. It's the underlying error. Now there's a fallacy for looking for, effect, uh, for causes in the effects. And no philosopher 
appeals to it. I would have looked, okay? I found it by go Baba made me read it. You know how a book falls off the shelf and, it t and you found out about Baba? Well, <laughs> I book fell off the shelf and fell open it. I mean, that's how I remembered. I don't, I, I never read this book, but I read this thing. And I had already had the thought, I was looking for it. What's wrong with this? It's a fallacy. And John Dewey, who's famous for uh, meddling with the uh, U.S. education, he's very disliked, but he was a good, um, good philosopher in some ways. He recognized this, and he wrote it, and I'm going to read it. But this is the hardest sentence you will ever, this is one, remember I told you that the absolute idealists like F.H. Bradley, they wrote in a very sort of opaque way, and it made people angry, and so they rejected it. He was one of those. This is written in 1896. He was not himself. I, I think he was trying to become a mod, modern, he's a psychologist, I believe. He was trying to be, and a philosopher. And he's, but, but he had earlier been a um, Hegelian. That's a neo-Hegelian, so part of that. So he writes in this way. However, this is one of the deepest damn things in print. Okay, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to try to explain it. The, okay, it's a fallacy that occurs, which he called the historical fallacy. Two, when, this is published when Baba was two years old. It's very interesting to me. A set of considerations which hold good only because of a completed process is read into the content of the process which conditions this completed result. Let me finish. It's, it's very hard. You have to read it many times, but it's on a slide. No, she's got a shot of it. A state of things characterizing an outcome is regarded as a true description of the events which led up to this outcome. When as a matter of fact, if this outcome had already been in existence, there would have been no necessity for the process. Okay, I'm going to repeat that in simpler words. And it, it, even the simpler words is something that people have to struggle with. And um, okay. Most simply put, the fallacy, actually I can say it even more simply, um, occurs when a person reads into a process the results that occur only because of the process. Okay? So you're, you're getting the cart before the horse, you're flipping. In short, we've been pro projecting effects into causes. We've been imagining into a causal process something that comes about as a result of the causal process. So, can I give you an example now? We've been putting the cart before the horse and when it comes to causes. I'm going to give you an example, and I had only thought of this um, to, for this, for this uh, talk. So, fine. Okay, so imagine, um, you know, Freud. We all know a little about Freud. And uh, Freud got his um, ideas of psychoanalysis by analyzing a lot of women. Um, and uh, he developed those ideas during a long period of time during, during those years. Now let's go back and let's go find Freud, and he's in high school, okay? And he's, he's almost 18, and he um, kind of likes girls, you know? And he's, um, but it's a Victorian era, and he's not very good with women. <laughs> So and he's a nerd, and what we call a geek today. And anyway, he, he, he comes up with an idea, and he goes, I know. I know what I'll do, is I'll become a, psych, a psychologist, and I will, I will interview, um, treat a lot of women, good-looking ones if possible, wealthy <laughs> ones, and I will, they will um, transfer their idea, uh, you, you know, their issues with their father onto me, so I'll be like a father figure. And then um, I'll get all entangled with them, which then they'll have to resolve. And then by doing this, I will be able to sublimate my Oedipal complex. Okay? What's the problem in this story? Okay? You couldn't have... And so that's why he became a psychologist. Okay? That's the story. Well, there's a problem with the story, is that he, 
he came up with all that language being a psychologist. Okay? It, it was a long process. And in this story, we're going back to the beginning of the process and we're reading con concepts back into the beginning of the con process as the cause that only came about as a result of that process of, of treating all those women. Epistemology is a word I introduced last week, and I said, I'm introducing this word, we don't have to spend any time on it, but we're going to mention it next week, and I want you to have a week to just, so it sounds like you've heard it before, and, uh, or and heard it defined before. All it means is, how do we know stuff? Okay? It's the science of how do we know stuff. So if we're going to get to talking a little, of talking about intuition, or whatever you think about intuition, everybody would agree that it's a way that you know stuff. So it falls under the rubric of epistemology, so this is very important too. We've talked about cause, now we're going to talk about this, and they're going to relate. I'm trying to be rational about this. I'm just being logical. People say this all the time. They say it to me all the time, and you know, they're I think they're wrong because I think I'm being rational and I'm being lied. Okay, so most people, there's a reason for that, by the way, which we're going to see. Um, everybody who's being rational, you notice lots and lots of rational people are like uh, arguing with each other all the time? Shankara pointed that out. He said, well, if logic worked, then wouldn't the logicians all agree? That's what Adi Shankara invented Advaita Vedanta Hinduism. That was a, that's how he could argue, like that. He was just good. So, do we even know what we mean by these words, rational and logical? I have found out that people don't. Um, they don't have, the first one, rational, doesn't have a strict a reason. It doesn't have a formal meaning. So, uh, we'll, we're, all, we're, we're all off the hook on, on not knowing that one. But I'm going to give you a, a general idea. And logic is a very specific thing. And it's always used wrong. Always. Okay. By, by, uh, by uh, lay people, even me, uh, you know, I, I'm just being logical. I'll do that. Okay, but it really means something. So when pressed, most can't say. In fact, they have no idea what the word these words mean. Here, we'll explain what they mean currently. Rational means you have a you have a reason, a rationale for your belief. Okay, you justify it with some reason. Okay, but it's not enough to just have any old reason. Because uh, I could simply say, well, I, 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 I want to believe it. And that's a reason. And actually, that's a pretty honest and good reason, frankly. That's sort of why, I, that's my reason that I think Baba is the avatar. Because I, well, I, you know, I, I choose to. Ask a person to stand still for a day as an exercise to show, show him that he has no free will. He'll say, I have free will, so now I'm going to show you that you don't have free will. I'm going to show you that you don't. I'm going to show you that you have, your mind is conditioned, preconditioned, and you have no free will to overcome it. And so you set them down. This actually happened with Baba, where he told a, 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 a sannyasin to go do this. And, he, and this actually happened, similar to my Arab story. So go sit there. Now I say, no, no go, go to bed. I told you this when I first got to Myrtle Beach. It was, a, it was I'm joking around with you at the till Ruba. I said, because I actually tried this, okay? So I know, so I'm, I'm not, okay. Um, there's a thing called a chilla. That's where you sit in a circle. Okay, you just do it for a day, okay? In a chilla, you don't look at anything. You also have your eyes closed. Now, anybody can get through one day without water. Okay, you got to do a lot more without food. Okay, but you got to be able to urinate. So, b before you go to bed, drink a bunch of water and have a urinal by your bed. So, when you wake up, don't open your eyes. Okay, don't move till the following day and have an alarm clock to let you know when it's the second day. Don't get up, don't move. If you have to pee, just do enough to get it in the, to get, to use the urinal. And then that's it. Have a bucket if, you, if you're not going to pee that much. Sometime about 11 o'clock in the morning, that person is going to find a very good reason why they need to get up. 
First of all, who the hell is Chris Ott to tell me what to do? He's nobody. You know, this is really impractical. You know, um, I can prove that I have free will. I'm going to have the free will to get up. Uh, this could be bad for my health. I think that I'm, I'm feeling dehydrated. I need a headache. I could get, you know, brain damage from my headache or something, you know. Um, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable. I, I think I could have a, you know, a stroke. Okay, they will have the best darn reason. And they'll be up and you'll go over and you'll go, why are you up? And they'll explain it to you. Maybe they'll be, that's how reason works. That's all reason. And you'll find a reason. We rationalize. That's all we do. Now, logic's different. So, so philosophers have sought a way that we can be sure that something's true, that nobody could ever disagree. And that's what they call logic. And I'm going to explain logic. And you have to know it. Because you have to know what bullshit it is, what it cannot do. Because we're going to come back to cause, and we're going to see that this isn't going to help us at all. OK. So. Logic works like this. I'm just going to give two examples. Um, well, maybe I, I, I doesn't. I don't have the slide here. Let's see what the next slide. Here's what they come up with. Okay. Okay. Good. Well. Well. I, I was going to do this in a different order. I, I'll, I'll do it in my original order. Or I'll, I'll get maybe lost. I have. I have you all ready to, to follow what I'm going to say about logic. Okay, I was going to give them um, the flying boy you know, story and uh, what was the other one? Oh, a, a bachelor. Okay, bachelor and flying boy. Okay, this is logic. Logic goes like this. First, you can have an if-then statement. So, if all boys can fly, Okay, that's premise one, okay? And Johnny is a boy. I taught this to Megan literally when she was three years old. And she got it right. That's, that's it's logical, because we're all logical. You're gonna, we'll find out later why we are. And then we have conclusion. Johnny can fly. Thank you. That's what she said when she was three years old. And it's Johnny can fly. I don't need to write it. Got it. Okay, so that is called um, a syllogism. And even though we've moved much past syllogisms, which were created by Aristotle, um, they really still amount to if um, and then. Okay, then Johnny can fly. Now, I want to point something out. This is already contained up here. This is a combining the first two. So you're not getting anything that you didn't already assume. So you can't learn anything by logic. Nor can you prove anything by logic. The only thing that logic can be used for is to see if you contradict it yourself. So if you say Baba is not the avatar, and then you get to the bottom and it shows that Baba's not the avatar, because it follows from Baba's not the avatar. By the way, the logic is reducible to what are called tautologies. That means a rose is a rose is a rose. You're never saying anything that you didn't already assume. It's, it's like a gumball machine. You put in, if you put in a red gumball, a red gumball falls out. If you put in a blue gumball, you get a blue gumball. It's like the magical broken gumball machine. It's, a, it's not doing anything. But if you go, Johnny cannot fly, then Johnny cannot fly, and that's symbolized like this, cannot fly. Well, then not Johnny can fly, then you contradicted yourself. And we see you have made a flaw in your logic. You see, we don't, we don't learn anything. It's not an avenue to knowledge. It's only a test to see if you're speaking right and if your syntax is correct. That's it. So it's not a tool. We can't now try to find the cause of the universe and our experience using that. 
Well, whatever you assume it is, it's going to fall back out as that gumball. If you put in the substratum, it's going to be the substratum. If you put in the external world, it's going to keep falling out the external world. So you're going nowhere. Because that's another problem, I should say. There's another problem in, in our reasoning. Well, we don't just use logic. But actually, when you sum up both these, none of these lead to anything. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to do it the way I, we're going to go backward. We're going to talk about these. And um, perception. We learn things by perceiving them. But did you know that unless you stand there staring and never stop, you only for a moment saw something? So when we say we, we appeal to perception, we're really appealing to our memory. But we appeal to our internal experience of our memory. No, okay, so when we talk about memory, you're talking about perception because you perceive your memory. But you, you're no longer looking at the, the car, okay? Ha, okay? How do you know the car's, you know, got a flat tire? Because I, I looked. But you're looking now at your memory. So memory is reducible to perception. Um, and then testimony. Did you know that 99% of what you do think that you know is testimony? No. Well, you can think about that later, but it's true. Well, any fact that you say, you either read it, you heard it, you didn't go do the test yourself. For instance, I would say that England is an island. But did you know if you were in an airplane flying over England, you can't tell it's an island because you're not high enough? All you see is land, well, 360 degrees. So the only way that you could test it is to get a compass and a piece of paper and get in a ship and sail all the way around the island of England, taking careful notes. And that's how they determined it. And how we learn it is from a map. And a map is a form of testimony. It's the testimony of people who literally did do that. OK? And their notes are passed on as testimony. And everything we know from Baba is from testimony. It's testimony. Everything's testimony. And testimony is testimony of something that that person has perceived. So it's like your memory is a memory of something perceived, and then testimony is the testimony. It's, it's sort of like it's the testimony of their memory. Uh, it's your memory of their memory of their perception. Now, how can you use that to find the cause? I already said you can't perceive the cause. You obviously can't remember the cause. It's never perceived. It's unperceivable. I mean, because if you could perceive it, it would be the effect. We're looking for the cause of the experience. This stuff's really, really tough. It's very deep, but there's a video, and there's going to be a book, and you spend time in it, and it's not, it's not a thing that's like, I have five apples in the car. Would you like one? This is tough, tough, but it's real. OK, I've already gone over deduction. And now induction. I have to explain induction. All, uh, there are two forms of logic, and then we're done, okay? Well, the scientific method just uses these, but we'll go over it too. It just uses what the, the there's basically just uh, perception and then logic, which includes deduction and induction. There are two forms of logic. I've already told you one. I gotta quickly tell you the other. It's very easy to explain. Induction is what scientists use. Induction is what we use all the time, and we call it logic uh, much more than the other. We don't really use the other. And it goes like this. I don't see what I read here first. It infers something in the future based on memory of the past. So let's say you go on eBay and you want to buy a dress, okay, or a pair of uh, pants, because we men and women wear pants. So, so you want to buy these nice pants, they look really good, and uh, trousers for an English. <laughs> and uh, two people that have it at the same price. Um, and the, the auction's gonna, gonna end soon. So we go look in their history. We go look in the history of their, their um, reviews. And then one of them, we see that for the last uh, uh, month, everybody's going, I didn't receive my package, no communication, this person did, do not use, you know, really bad, it's been going real bad for them. Then you read the other one, it's 100%. Trust the, fantastic. Got my, pan, my pants and they're fit and it's just super. Oh, that the came the wrong size, but he took it back and he paid for the shipping both ways. Trusts on the five stars. So they got 
hundreds of those. So which one are you going to buy from? Well, you're going to buy from the one with the 100% with the, um, positive history because it seems sort of logical, or and it is called inductively logical, that it, 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 the future tends to be like the past. So if he's acted this way in the past, there's a good chance he's going to act this way in the future, and I'm going to get my trousers. And vice versa with the other guy. But however, that's, that's only just iffy because it's possible that this guy is, uh, was um, just fooling people all along and he's really going to skip town and he's going to start. Uh, this actually happened to me. Um, the guy had a perfect history and suddenly in, in China and then suddenly right after I bought, he closed the site and then all the, all the reviews said it's the, that the tracking says delivered and I didn't get it. So the person's sending f empty boxes to fake addresses so that it'll look like it gets a tracking. It's on its way. And because it's China, he's got like three, three weeks to do this. And I, and, but I'll, I'll get, okay, so just because the guy and he had great reviews. Okay. So the induction is called weak, or it can be strong or weak, depending on probability. But the probability always remains identical, by the way. No matter how many reviews a person has that are positive, it's still just as possible and in statistics like gambling statistics that he's going he's to not in the future. Just like they say, if you roll uh, seven five times, your chances of getting a seven the next time are still one in six. And it's been pointed out that just because the sun has risen, um, for all time in history, it's possible that the sun will not rise tomorrow, the earth will be hit by a meteor and destroyed or something like this, because, and it's just as likely that it will not rise tomorrow than, than if it had only risen twice or, okay, so it's, 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 a, it's a statistical truth. So induction, now try to apply induction to cause. Well, you can't. Because it, it requires perceiving something in the past and then assuming it'll be like that, that way in the future. But we can't perceive the cause of our own perceiving. So we can't use induction. It's useless. Okay. Now science, I, just it's a repetition of the same. It kind of goes off the bottom of the page. But um, it observes correlations. Let me just tell you. I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time. But... Um, Science just uses what we've already covered, and so why, why repeat it, okay? But these, I don't know, I, I do want to repeat. Observe, there's something cool in it. Observe, up, 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 um, observe, up, science observes correlations. Like, when, when I, wherever I drop this, it always falls. That's all they can do. They observe stuff. They can't observe the cause any better than we can. Okay, they're people. <laughs> but then, they give a name, they must give names to effects and call that cause, they hide the say size, for names like Boyle's Law, okay, named for the person who discovered it in Robert Boyle in the 1600s, Boyle's Law really only named a correlation. I'll tell you in a minute what the correlation is so you can dramatize this, which is an effect. Okay, so Boyle's Law is the name of an effect. It's not the name of a cause. So here's what Boyle's Law is. Uh, you put a bunch of gas in, in a balloon. Okay, now if you can shrink the balloon, the pressure of the gas is going to increase. There's Boyle's Law. You take the same amount of gas and, and you put it in a, in a, you know, pop the balloon and now it's filling up the whole room and it's going to be less dense. <laughs> that's Boyle's Law. That's a pretty simple thing. That's not a cause. That's just telling you what happens. All they're doing is they're describing phenomena, and they're describing correlation. When, when I perceive this, then I always perceive this. So, same thing with everything. What is a lever in science? Well, whenever we pull down on this side, this side goes up. And if it's long enough, it'll go like this. And you have a perfect description of it. And those are done in laws, and they can do the math, and they hand you the math, and they go, well, there's the math, and that's the name of the math. And then you go, well, what, what's causing it? Why? Well, that, that's the cause. Well, how can the, then we're back to the sub. I mean, we don't, 
that doesn't work. The math can't be the cause. The, the, or the law. All the law is is a name for something that we keep seeing happen. So the power of science comes from its power through induction to predict things that are going to happen under certain conditions. They can predict that if we can mash this thing tighter, the gas is going to get more dense, okay? And by doing that, they can use laws like that to produce things like the atomic bomb, which uses Boyle's law, okay? So, you, 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 so they are able to make tools in these really neat uh, gizmos that can do incredible um, uh, things. And they can perform all these tasks. And it's, they seem supernatural. So, because, okay, I have to, um, well, I'll just keep going. Okay, clearly something is missing in our so-called reasoning if we are to move forward. If we can't explain anything, well, there's something we don't, we're not so swift. We can make things and we can kill ourselves with them, but, and we can, uh, you know, um, Monsanto and stuff, very clever, but they're, they're not, they're not, they don't know very much. Now, you can't see causes. I'm going to summarize those. We are no better in a way than the savages making up magical things with magical powers to explain things. We really haven't moved on. We've gotten more glib. And we have no justification for these hypostasis, these, these at all. Uh, for instance, we can't observe them. These things we've, ex we've described to explain our experience, we can't observe them. Um, science can't help, as I've already explained. Um, there's nothing intuitive about them. When I tell you that you're not seeing the real room, when you go and see Baba, you know, and he's sitting in the chair, that, oh, well, really, the, his body's in the external world. Um, well, you, you're just perceiving the representation of the electrical firing. It's like, that's not actually intuitive. Intuitively, I'm seeing Jeff, right, just fine. And, this, and the Jeff that I'm experiencing, that's, that's Jeff's body. It may not be his soul, but it's his body, okay? So if the intuitive is actually what they call naive realism or direct realism. That's how we experience it. We experience that with seeing things as they are physically. So it's not intuitive. And um, we can't do science on it because uh, they, they have to have a test and they have to observe the test and repeat the test and so they can't do that. Hypostasis has never worked to explain anything. And this is what I'm gonna say is really important. It, in fact, it goes in the opposite direction of explaining things because it adds to the sum of the things that, to explain. Every time you make up a thing to explain it, a form, a substratum, now you have your form or your substratum to explain. Hence the sixth man, the third man argument. The newly invented hypostasis, this hypostasis that is beyond our ability to explain, it, it, it adds to the sum of the problem, not, not getting us anywhere. It does not lessen the burden, it increases the burden. Oh, it's not working. Now, this is long, but I'd like a shot. I'm not going to read it. It's from my book. It's from my first book uh, from 2004. And I'm not going to linger because you can freeze the frame on YouTube. But I don't have time. I wish I could. But uh, I want to really. I... Go ahead. Okay, I want to read it down. Okay. This is from the back of my book. It's on the, 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 but it's also in the, in the book. Long ago, before he had the complicated metaphysical theories that he has today, man had his experience to explain. Over time, he invented theoretical entities to explain his experience, as we've explained. He invented gods, forms, matter, monads, noumena, minds, spirit, the ether, space-time, superstrings, dimensions, etc., etc. Gradually, these invented things became the things that which required explaining. Great arguments were generated to explain them, to prove the existence of the entities that he had made to in, had, had invented to explain experience. Gradually, man began 
to question experience itself. Remember, on the 20th century, which was last week, they say that we do not experience the world, okay? Since it no longer seemed compatible with his theories. See, it's incompatible because they can't explain why the external world can explain it, can create an internal world, so they just decide to, get, to claim that we can't perceive the world. That there's some, that doesn't make sense it does completely, utterly, the nth degree of, of crazy, a desperation. But, you know, on an honest try, give them credit. Experience, that event which had once been beyond dispute and the starting point of man's inquiry, was now the theoretical entity. And his invented entities, such as matter and energy, for which he had no direct evidence in, the, in their scientific sense, were reality. The world was finally totally upside down. Which is what Baba that said. That is what Baba said. That's right. That's what Baba said. Very good. I, hadn't, I wouldn't have thought of it. No, I wouldn't have thought of them. Rethinking, reframing the question. What is it we are really fundamentally, in all these searches for explanation, truly seeking to explain? I think you already know. The answer is our experience. Because if we want to know how such and such does so and so, we are really asking, what we're really asking is, what causes us to experience so and so whenever we experience such and such? That's what are the real questions. So all the questions of cause are asking about experience. It seemed like it was just the mind-body problem. Suddenly it is the problem. The mind-body problem is no longer just a problem. Obviously the mythemes we have invented to explain our experience can't themselves be explained. We can't even see them. So how can we explain? Hence, what else is there to explain beyond experience? All philosophers were trying to explain experience, but few realized that none succeeded. We go over Thales' water and Plato's forms, and they never could find that little miracle that turned it, that was their process by which they created that experience for which they were invented in the first place. And science continues to do the same thing today. We have dark matter, dark energies. Do you think that people see these things? They don't. They are words. They are nominal causes. They have no process. They want you to think so, but they don't. They're names. They're placeholders. They're the name of a phenomenon that they observed, some effect that, that they saw in their particle accelerator. And then they gave the cause of the strange phenomenon in the particle accelerator, they gave it the name a god particle or, 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 or strange matter. And you know what, they call it strange matter because it doesn't act right according to our assumptions. Well, you know, so it's, they just keep making more. And if you, you must know, more than a few very intelligent people have noticed there's something wrong in that. And that there's a guy who wrote, n nobody ever got, a physicist wrote this. In one of those books I, I mentioned in the first two classes, I said, he said, no one ever got a Nobel Prize for saying something doesn't exist. You get a Nobel Prize for coming up with a new thing, like the God Particle, which got a Nobel Prize, for which there's scandalous books, because it's such utter nonsense. The Higgs boson. The external world is a mythene. When we seek to explain our experience of the external world, we still have our external world to explain. Um, I've already said all that. In the final analysis, science cannot deal in causes, only effects. And this is why Baba says science doesn't know anything. When Baba said that, he said, scientists know nothing. It's on, in the print edition of Lord My Hair, it's page 1871, and it's in the online one. You can look up the word, scientists know nothing. And it was in reference to cause. He said, they know the first form to the last form but they don't know why it's happening. They don't know what's causing it to occur, okay? Since the professed endeavor of science is to search for causes, knowing nothing of cause, that is outside its purview, because it can only deal in a phenomena that it can perceive, so it's outside its purview. It's the purview of metaphysics, it's not the purview of science. 
It knows literally nothing, except it can state things it's observed in the past, but as I said, induction is weak. It knows nothing at all about what it claims it is able to explain in those sli the slide of the funny scientist, because we can explain it all. Okay. And then it would call up to an alien, because I can't explain anything. And science has no method to know anything about causes. It can only describe effects. Science can observe and record, can observe, and they can observe correlations, which it calls laws, and it is by this knowledge that they are able to get their great power and um, by predicting outcomes like Boyle's law and what's going to happen if you do if you put this chemical in we know exactly what's going to happen on the outcome of the process they are able to make these <clears throat> these gadgets and this that, 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 that perform tasks and then this ability so impressed the early 20th century, after watching it happen for 100 years in the 19th century, that they thought they were omniscient and omnipotent. Science, they felt like, well, we're just philosophers, we're just guessing. I mean, they've been doing all this stupid hypostasis all these years, and then they, well, look, well, they're actually getting results. They can make, they can make a toaster of them. I can't, and my wife makes fun of me, my children don't respect I love joking, <laughs> but you get it? They, this is why you got scientism. The idea was like science has the, the avenue to truth on all things. And it wasn't based on some, some facts, facts about reality, it was based on gadgets. So because they can make gadgets, one day they'll be able to explain the mind-body problem. And then philosophy just gave up and started doing working on syntax, which is all they do now. And you know, they, they choose people in philosophy departments based on their math scores, not their ability to think. Really? Because all they're going to be doing is uh, all boys can fly. Uh, that's all they're going to do. Oh, I forgot the other one, uh, but it doesn't matter. You get it. All bachelors are unmarried. Logical. That's the meaning of the word. We already assume it. <laughs> if Johnny is a bachelor, he's not married because that's what about that, that's another I forgot to write that it's called analyticity and it's all complicated but it's as simple as that I should have slipped that in I forgot this ability okay I close them to include uh, the scientism then was naive and it's based on basically schoolboy idea of science by these um, by these um, 20th century early 20th century of philosophers who were went into philosophy and not science and they they, they assumed way way too much uh, power to and to these people. Okay, so reviewing in the end, and this is the last slide. Only uh, we only have our experience to explain. Its cause can't be in experience. Hypostasis doesn't work. It makes no sense, and it looks for causes in the effect. A cause requires a process by which it does its causing. An explanation requires a process by which the cause causes, we should say, which no one has been able to produce. We seek a cause and how it causes, the process by which it causes our experience, with all its wonders, with all its wonders. And that is the end of this talk, Jay Baba. I'm so glad I got through that. Sorry I went over an hour. Thank you for coming. Really, thank you for coming. Really, really, really thank you. Okay, that would be easier to follow watching the v video and stopping it, and watching it, and stopping and reading the slides and reading the slides twice because I promise there are things that can no one in the world can read a certain sentences and just go yeah, that, especially if it's new, it's strange, it, it just cannot be done. It cannot be done by anybody. So, for instance, that statement by John Dewey. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's there. And if you read it over and over, I bet there are people who have read it over and over and, and failed. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I used to talk about the, the, the historical fallacy, and I would tell people, I'd say, um, 
okay, let, I want to try to teach you this. And I did this, and these people were very were academics. And, and about, but they were friends, so it wasn't like they were my teachers, but they were my friends, and they read my book uh, this is ten years ago. And I'd say, tell, now do you remember hypostasis? And they go, yeah. And I go, well now can you tell it back to me? No, I can't. Like, I'm not reading the whole thing, just all I wanted them to be able to say is, the fallacy occurs when you're reading the cause, the, 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 you're reading the cause into the effect. You're projecting the, your cause into the effect. That's all. I, that's like, can you say that back? I don't think they. I got that before I read it. I already knew that I was looking for the words. I found it in Dewey. Dewey never helped me. The only thing it had allowed me to do was be able to say, hey, it's got a name and it's reputable. And I wrote the Wikipedia article on it, which is basically just the name of it, the, qu the quote, and the reference. And there's nothing else to say. Somebody went in and tried to do it easier you know, rewording. There's no perfectly easy wording of it. It's like turning your head inside out. And that's the crux. Uh, oh, but this will become more actually be, start to become intuitive and, and, and clear in the subsequent talking. Because we're going to talk about this in a different in more anecdotal ways and in a different way and in different terminology soon. And then this talk will begin to make more sense, what I was saying. It's, it's a little like you kind of have to go forward in time a little and then you can come back. But the, the order in which this is being done, there is no other order this could be done. Ideas build on the previous ones. This was a hard one. And like I say, I don't know a person who ever got it. No, I do not know a person who ever got it. But Dewey did. Dewey did. All right, J-Bob. <laughs>